uh, pick up uh, where we left off last week in the book of Luke. If you were um, not here last week, I encourage you to go back and listen. Uh, Patrick uh, went through Joseph and Mary presenting Jesus at the temple as a baby, um, and he went through the Simeon and Anna, and, and one of the things that just stuck out to me um, gave uh, Aubrey and I what we call spiritual goosebumps, um, was when, when Patrick was going from Luke 2 back to Leviticus and back and forth, and, and all the things that um, Mary and Joseph had to do to present Jesus to at the temple, um, well, well, they didn't have what they were, like, what was required was to bring a, bring a lamb. Unless they couldn't afford a lamb, then they could bring two turtle doves. And so Jesus and Mary show up to the temple presenting Jesus, and they don't have a, they don't have a lamb. So they have to bring two turtle doves as a sacrifice. And what are they holding in their arms? The Lamb of God. And so that, that was just one highlight from last week that I was really excited about um, and encouraged me and got me excited that I got to preach uh, this week um, because we're going to pick up right where he left off. We'll finish chapter two this morning. And uh, before we do anything, I want to pray for our morning and our time together that God would just uh, show up and meet us all where we're at. So let's do that. Lord, we, um, we desperately need you. Um, we are small and um, lacking, and you are massive and not lacking anything. And so I just ask that you would meet us where we're at, that you would um, give us all uh, focus and just um, attunement to what you're up to this morning, that we would um, just be available to listen to you, and that you would work in our hearts, um, that we would fall more in love with you, and that we would know you uh, greater. And just ask that you would uh, take over, uh, take over from the platform and take over in the pews, and that you would be the reason we're here. And uh, we love you. In your name, amen. All right, before we start reading chapter two, I want to start off with a story. Um, it's actually a couple of stories, but it's really the same story. Uh, we, uh, my family, uh, we love going camping. It's like our favorite thing. We go camping a lot in the summer. And one of our favorite places we make sure we go every summer is uh, Honeyman State Park over um, it's just south of Florence. And uh, often we go with a group of friends. And we've developed this tradition over the years uh, to make sure at some point during the camping trip that one child gets lost. And uh, it's, a, it's a great tradition. And uh, two years ago, um, we were over there, and we had just gotten there. We were getting all settled in, unpacking the trailer. The kids were like, oh, we finally made it in the car for like an hour and a half. We can get out. And they're running around, and um, we're setting up. And Aubrey pops out of the, the trailer door. She's like, hey, babe, where's Annie? Um, this is a phrase I've heard lots in <laughs> my life. Um, and she's four, four years old at the time, and I was kind of like, I don't know, I thought you had Annie. She's like, no, I don't have Annie, I thought you had Annie. Um, and uh, it turns out neither of us had Annie. And uh, this was uh, scary. And you got a few seconds of like irritation with the other spouse, like how come you didn't have the kid? And all of a sudden it's like, oh no, like our kid is actually missing. Um, and some kids just have the propensity to wander off. Like you probably, have, like if you have a few kids, you have at least one that's just a wanderer. And Annie um, is this child for us, especially when she was little. Like a lot of times when you are um, missing a child and, or, or they won't come get in the car, they won't go to what you're doing, you can, I don't know if you guys do this, maybe it's a bad example, but I'll be like, okay, we're leaving you. I'm like, go get in the car. Um, bye. And a lot of kids will be like, no, don't leave me, daddy. And they'll run and get in the car. But when I do this, I would do this to Annie at just a young age. Like, Annie, we're leaving. Can get in the car? And I get in the car, and she'd be like, "Okay, bye," and like walk the other way. Like, she's like, "I don't really. This is the goal, actually, to get away from you." So, um, but Annie is now missing at Honeyman State Park, and um, we are quickly transitioning from being like irritated to terrified. Like, where is Annie? Like, this is not good. She's a four-year-old girl, and and after a few minutes, your mind goes to like the worst possible, like. She's either in the lake, someone's picked her up. Like, I'm like thinking, I gotta get to the exit of this park so I can catch the creepy van that's trying to leave the campground. Like, I'm terrified. Um, 
we're frantically looking, and then um, the kids are looking. I got their own little search party. I'm like, this search party is going to lose another kid because they're going to be off looking for Annie and get lost. And uh, it's terrifying. Um, not knowing where your kid at is one of the scariest um, things in, in the world, I think. And we've checked the playground. We've checked the woods. We've had someone go check and make sure she's not by water. And and we can't find her anywhere. And then all of a sudden, Aubrey sees coming up the road the uh, park ranger's golf cart. And there's like a little pink scooter hanging off the back and Annie sitting in the passenger seat of the golf cart. And uh, uh, <laughs> the park ranger is like an old old gentleman. He's like, does, does Annie belong to you? And we're like, yep, that's, that's our little girl. And uh, what had happened was um, she had took it upon herself to... Um, go down, she saw as we came in a place where they sell firewood uh, at the campground. She, she took her scooter down there, she rode it down there um, to get some firewood. And she was going to get some firewood for our campsite and bring it back up and she, she tried to actually buy firewood from the park ranger and they're like, where's your mom and dad? And that's when she got in the golf cart. Um, but but uh, I was asking her about this yesterday as I was thinking about this, and I learned something. She said, Daddy, you told us to get firewood, get the firewood. And there was firewood in the car. Like, she was supposed to get it out of the back of the van, and she just took off on her scooter to go get some firewood. And it was terrifying for us, but her only concern was making sure we had wood for the s'mores that night. And, uh, yeah, terrifying story. Then the next year, we go back with some friends, and someone else's kid got lost. I won't tell you the name of the child, um, but his dad's name is Josh. And uh, <laughs> this kid gets lost, and it's like, oh, here we go again. Get the search party going. We're all looking around, and um, the park rangers assisted again this time. And uh, I'll never forget this. Uh, the child, unnamed child of Josh, was found, and um, Hannah, I mean, his mom, asked him, um, how did you feel when you were lost? <laughs> he replied, I'll never forget this. He looked up at her and he goes, I thought, I guess I'm just a forest guy now. <laughs> <laughs> like he's just going to live in the wild for the rest of his life. I love it. So funny. Um, but children have their way of getting lost. Um, and if you're a parent today and you've lost track of your child at some point, you know um, this is terrifying, but you're also not alone. And in our time today, we're going to see that even Jesus' parents lost him. So at least you didn't lose Jesus. If you haven't already, please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. And we'll be picking up in, at the end of the chapter, verse 39 to 52. And I want to just read through the whole thing together, and then we'll go back um, and look at um, each verse individually. Sound good? All right, verse 39. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and their acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned, Jerusalem searching for him, returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. 
And Jesus increased in wisdom and, st and stature and in favor with God and man. Okay. Back to thir verse 39. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. I included these verses this morning because I wanted to just see how the infant narrative of Jesus ends. Like, I was kind of seeing this as, as a play. And the scene of baby Jesus would, would end here, but, it, but, but Luke would end it by making sure we knew without a doubt, that the parents of the king of kings did everything according to the law. They did everything according to the law. They didn't take any shortcuts. They were being obedient, not legalistic. We talked about that last week. There's a big difference. I won't go down that rabbit trail, but there's a big difference in obedience and legalism. They weren't being self-righteous or boasting in themselves. They were just being obedient and doing things the way of the Lord. And once it was all done... They went back to Nazareth. All right, let's go. Let's go home. Let's raise this boy. And with that, act one, baby Jesus closes. The curtains close. And then verse 40 says, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And to just kind of keep this um, theater analogy going, I almost read that verse as, as the narrator updating us with what's, what's taking place behind the scenes as the curtains are are closed. We see that back in Nazareth, baby Jesus is going to grow up. He's going to grow up physically, and he's going to grow up spiritually. And the baby narrative we're reading is actually really similar to the baby narrative of who? John the Baptist, right? We've gone through that a few times. And if you go back to the end of chapter 1, uh, all the way in verse 80, we see that that's how, very similarly, that's how the, the birth narrative of John the Baptist ends. The child grew and became strong in spirit. And Luke has been comparing these infancy narratives. The difference here is that John is growing in spirit and Jesus is growing in wisdom and he's being filled up by God, his father. Okay, new scene. Luke does this. He shows the baby Jesus scene. Curtains close for like 12 years. There's nothing for like... 12 years, and then he opens them up really quickly. We get one story when Jesus is 12, and he closed the curtains again. And we see Jesus again in chapter 3. He's 30 years old. We're in learning about the beginning of his ministry, and it starts off with his baptism. But here we are in scene 2. Chapter 2, verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Okay, so just how scene one ended with the devoutness and, and obedience of Mary and Joseph doing all the baby things the right way, what are they doing at the beginning of the, of the new scene? He's 12 years old, what are they going to do? This is just another nod to their devoteness, their, their obedience this isn't, this isn't even a feast that they all had to go to every year. Like this is Passover. Men of God were required to go, like traditionally the men of God, so males age 13 and up were required to go to this every year. But it says that they went as they go every year. And so the whole family, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, is, is going on this journey to Jerusalem. It wasn't uncommon for the, the women and the, and the children to stay home while the men went. But this time... Like every other year for this family, they're all going because they are devout followers of God. They want to, to, to be close to God and do things his way, and this is a big deal. Verse 42. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. So contextually, we know that, that Jesus was a Jewish boy. And at age 12, he would go to the temple this year and learn about all the temple things, like all the things. He would, he would pick this up for the last time before he went as a 13-year-old and he was like tested as becoming like a son of obedience, like a, a, basically a man before the eyes of God. He would be responsible for himself um, before the eyes of God. And, and the age of 13, historically, 
um, has been a huge milestone um, for, for, for Jewish men of God and really for, um, for men of God. We just had, um, my oldest just turned 13 uh, this month and we got to do a, a really cool kind of um, milestone thing. I felt we had a handful of his buddies over and his buddies' dads come over and they all kind of spoke into his life and it, you could see the the 13 year old boys around him were, were like, wait a minute, we're not just playing video games and, and, and Nerf guns, but we really like this. Like we need, like we need this, we're growing up. You get the sense of we're, we're growing up. Um, so anyway, there's all kinds of, of learning and things going on and, and um, things for Jesus to, to, to know and understand um, because he's gonna come back in one year and he's gonna need to have mastery over these things at age 13. I want to just put ourselves in the moment for a little bit as, as we just consider looking at 12-year-old Jesus. He showed up, Passover is happening. He can look around, there's people celebrating, there's people so excited to be at the temple, to celebrate this feast, to like all of these things. And he's looking around and it's beautiful and it's like this eager, like amused, like, oh my goodness, what is happening? Like, this is amazing. What are all of these things pointing to? Him. All the things he's taking and he's looking around. Look at this. Look at the Passover. It's just remember back what happened and now we're celebrating that. But all of that is pointing to him. Really cool. And I want to remember that, that Luke is including very little about Jesus' childhood. But this story is here. It's significant. And for Luke, it was the only one worth including. And then just like, pic- like picturing 12-year-old Jesus, so excited, like he sticks around because he's so enamored by what is happening here at this festival. And it's all about him. Like historically, it's remembered. All of those things were pointing to Jesus and he's there for it, even at 12 years old. <sighs> And, and this inclusion in the text is, is more evidence that Mary and Joseph were doing their part. They're doing their part to make sure that their boy was well-versed in their faith, especially at this important festival. And, and to further hammer home the point, uh, Luke includes that the family stayed for the whole festival. Verse 43 says that, and when the feast was ended, and the Greek translates that to when the days were completed. Right, so it wasn't like they just hit up the feast and bounced. Like they were there for the whole festival. They took it all in. Jesus was there a little bit longer than they were, um, but they took it all in. Like they were doing it right. They were committed. Uh, and I just want to give a little bit of props to Mary and Joseph. Right? Like just for a minute. Like they have a shameful moment coming up very soon. Um, but, but here we see this example over and over again. And I think Luke includes it on purpose of them modeling for their son what it looked like to be submitted to God. And this isn't the main point of the text here, but I think it's, it's worth noting. Man, they were trying. They've come from a, a, a crazy situation. Like, you know how, like, <laughs> the angels, and all of a sudden they're pregnant, and God, we're not married yet, and all these things, and, and they are just obedient, and they're following the Lord. Um, and that's really cool to see. They're trying to love God and do things His way as parents. And just as an aside, like, parents, this matters. Our obedience and our kids getting to watch our obedience to the Father matters. What if we saw our obedience to the Father through the same lens as we saw our children's obedience to us? What do I mean? What would that look like practically? Do we hold ourselves to a standard with God that we would see as unacceptable for our children to be held to us as their parents? How many of you parents would say that the formula for raising a healthy, mature, loving, kind child is to give them whatever they want and never require them to obey you? No one. Well, that's good. We passed that test. Why then do we expect this from our Heavenly Father? Why do we expect this or even demand this from our Heavenly Father? Our obedience as parents to our Heavenly Father really, really matters. Our children are watching and our children are learning. And our obedience matters. It's not legalism. Okay, that was kind of a rabbit trail, but I think it was worth one taking, hopefully. Um, Back to verse 43. 
As they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. Yikes. <laughs> oh, man. 44. Supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. So they've gone a day's journey without Jesus. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. Okay, here we are. Mary and Joseph have lost Jesus. They've lost him and he's been gone a day. We can all feel a little more normal as parents now, right? <laughs> but, but, but what's happening? Remember, they're in a, in a caravan. I can't help but picture like our church at family camp walking like from the lake up to the field or, or somewhere. We're just like, there's a bunch of kids and parents in here and hopefully they all make it. I know I've heard parents, once we get to like the lake or get to somewhere, they're like, hey, where's so-and-so? Like, uh, probably in the caravan somewhere. Um, but you, but I, I can picture walking in a large group, but this wasn't just from the lake to the field. This is 85 mile hike, an 85 mile journey. According to Google Maps, this would have been about 29 hours of walking, like straight walking. If they walked straight, it would have been 29 hours. I think it's on the screen. Um, that's Google Maps today. Uh, for some reason, I thought it'd be fun to include where the coffee shops were if you took that hike today. Um, there's not a lot of coffee once you get too far north, so um, if you're considering that. But that, that's a long hike, 29 hours of walking. Traditionally, as they traveled, um, the, the women and the young children, this is how they did caravans, the women and the young children would walk in the front, and the men and the older children, or the young adult children, like 13 and up, would walk in the back. Now, how old is Jesus? He's 12. And he's 12 right now. So he's kind of right on the edge of both of those categories. So I know this probably never happens in your families. But it seems reasonable that there could have been some unspoken expectations amongst parents here. <laughs> like, um, I, thought, I thought Jesus was with you. No, I thought he was walking back there in the back with you. And uh, just these unspoken expectations over who had the kid. It could have been really easy to assume that Jesus was with daddy, and it could have been easy to assume that Jesus was with mama, but clearly neither parent knew where Jesus was. The whole hike, the whole first day. And they get to the end of the first day of travel, and um, they're settling in, they're making their fire, and all of a sudden it's like, okay, it's like, he's probably hungry, he should be here by now, and Jesus didn't show up. And all of a sudden it sets in. We have lost our boy. Um, we already talked about what this feels like as a parent. This, is, this goes from being irritated to terrified really quick. Why do you think they traveled in large groups? It's a dangerous road. They're going through Samaria, first of all. There's dangerous people out there. There's wild animals. Like, this is a dangerous journey. And they just, it's hitting them, like, as each moment passes. Oh, no, he hasn't just been gone for, like, 30 minutes. He's been gone potentially all day long. Because the entire hike, I thought he was up there with you, and you thought he was back here with me. So we don't know where he is. It is setting in. It is terrifying. 12-year-old Jesus is straight up missing, and they haven't seen him all day long. You can put yourself in, in these shoes or sandals. You can put yourself here as a parent. They're feeling so many things all at once. The, this, this fear, they're terrified. Their heart is beating faster and faster by the minute as they look around and it says they're checking in with acquaintances and relatives. Have you seen him? Have you guys seen Jesus? And, and, and then you know like the shame that comes from trying to ask someone if they've seen your kid when they're lost. Like you, go to, you lose your kid at the store. Hey, have you seen, he's like this, uh, or the park ranger. Like, like that sets in and you're like, I feel like the worst mom in the world. I don't even know where my own kid is. So they're experiencing all of these feelings at the same time, and, and they can't find them anywhere. It's embarrassing. It's terrifying. He's nowhere. And after only 12 years, you can start to see, I think, some of what Simeon had warned Mary about just a few 
verses back that, that her role as Jesus' mother would be soul piercing. Her, she's feeling this in her soul, like my child is missing. Verse 45. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. There's only one option left. He's not at camp. We don't see him anywhere on the road. It's got to just retra- retrace our steps. So they walk back and they get back to Jerusalem. It says, after three days, man, that's a long time. Three days of not knowing where your 12 year old is. They found him sitting in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him, sorry, that was me. All who heard him were amazed. He's sitting in the temple. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and at his answers, like all that he knew. And after three days of looking for their boy, they finally found him. One day traveling back, two days searching around the city. It's a really long time, but they found him. He was safe and he, he is where he would say he's right where he's supposed to be. 12-year-old Jesus, sitting in the temple, hanging out with the teachers. He was listening to them, it says. He was asking questions. He was answering questions. And these religious teachers who had like devoted their whole lives to this are just sitting there like, wow, how does he know this much stuff? This is amazing. These grown men in the temple, these experts in the law were baffled by how much Jesus knew. We don't know the details of what they were discussing, but we know they were clearly very impressed. And if you know anything about um, the educational standards for for the 12-year-old Jewish child at the time, um, just the normal expectations were staggering. So the fact that they were amazed really says something. Patrick and I were talking about this this week. There was three kind of stages of their education. Um, Bet Sefer would begin when they were like five or six years old. And this is all they had to do starting at ages five and six. Um, mem- memorize the law. Memorize the Torah starting at age five. And I don't mean the Ten Commandments. Like the first five books of the Bible, they had to memorize them, even Leviticus. That's just the first stage. And then when they're like around nine or 10 years old, they, they start Bet Midrash, which would be to memorize all kinds of other Hebrew scripture. And then at 14, they would uh, start Bet Talmud, um, where they would be like with a rabbi um, in like a Socratic way of education, just getting to know more and more and testing and, and just learning so, so much. So that was like the bar for kids' ministry. <laughs> I'm sorry, but they're not learning that downstairs this morning. And like, um, they're learning the gospel, though, and I'm really thankful for our um, kids' ministry team. But, but the bar for kids at that age was super high. And they're sitting with Jesus at age 12, and they're like, what? This is, this is insane. How does this, this kid know so much? And just blew everything else out of the water. They were speechless. How did he know all of this? What do you guys think? How did he know all of this? First service didn't have an answer either, so it's okay. Um, There's a lot of different speculation. Um, Could it be that he was fully God and fully man and just kind of knew? Maybe. Could it be that God revealed this knowledge like directly to him, like, like a phone a friend kind of as he's getting quizzed by these people in the temple and God's like, this is the answer, this is it. Um, I, as I was studying this week, I came across an option that I hadn't thought of. This is what R.C. Sproul thinks if you um, read him or listen to him at all. He says that perhaps it was because the, the mind of the divine child had never been touched by sin. You know, he was perfectly sinless, sinless, untouched by sin, untouched by the fall. In his mind, like, can you fathom how much your mind has been impacted by the fall? So 12-year-old Jesus, could it have just been that? Steve said, he, he goes to Isaiah 50 verse 4. Um, so if you get bored with me, you can turn to Isaiah 50 verse 4 and read that and see what you, 
Maybe that's what it is. Um, but it, it, it's an interesting case. Could it have been just, a, just fully man, fully child Jesus, but un, unimpacted by the fall in his mind? Interesting case. Regardless, we don't have to know that to know that the teachers were amazed. And he would return to the temple um, in, in Matthew chapter 7, and he would be identified again as very impressive in the temple. When, when Matt, in Matthew, it says that he was teaching in the temple as one who had authority, not as one of the scribes. So it was diff- he was different. Um, he would return to the temple many times, actually, um, and he would uh, one day destroy it. I can't help but wonder how many of the Pharisees that were sitting here with this 12-year-old innocent Jesus, just baffled and, and blown away and amazed by how he knew all of these things at age 12, would really just in like a couple of decades be part of the plot to kill him. Interesting. We're not there yet. Um, but it's going to go there. Verse 48. Uh, Finally, they find their boy. And when the parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. What we're, seeing, what we're seeing unfold here is um, not little. This is, these are, the, are going to be the first earliest recorded words that Jesus would speak. It's the first time he's, he's, he's speaking in um, the book of Luke. And what he says is revealing the whole point of this passage. The point of this passage is Jesus' unique connection to his Father. Jesus is referring to the temple of the Most High as what? This is his father's house. He has learned this truth at the temple. You guys remember, um, this is also where Zechariah Zachariah learned this truth, isn't it? Back in Luke chapter 1, he goes into the temple. Remember they tied the rope around him and, in case he didn't make it out um, because he was in the presence of God. And he learned that his son would prepare the way for the Son of God. Now Jesus is in the temple and now in these closing um, kind of words of his childhood narrative, it is revealed to Jesus that he is the son of God in the temple. And being the son of God would be the most important relationship of Jesus' life. It would be super important to who he is. And we can see even as a 12-year-old two truths that are going to echo throughout his entire life. People are going to struggle to understand who Jesus is and why he's there. People are going to struggle to understand who is Jesus and what is he doing. But Jesus is certain of who he is. He's certain of who his father is. And he is certain of what his mission is, of why he's there. There's no doubt. There's no confusion. He's not, I don't know what I'm supposed to... He knows. And he belongs to his father and he knows that now. And he is on the planet that he created. He is on the planet that he created, that he came down from heaven to dwell amongst us to do what? The will of his father who sent him. And his mom doesn't get it. She, 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 she's astonished. She's confused. She blames him for causing all the panic she just went through. But Jesus simply looks at her without any sin and says, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And then we read in in verse 50 what is all too obvious. They don't understand. His parents don't understand. They don't get it. They must have felt so lonely as his parents. After this great manhunt for their, like, you can think the last three days of their life have been terrifying. So much like, like fear, like, like taking over them, like paralyzing them, like, where is our son? Where is our son? And you assume after three days, you're probably going to find his body. 
You're probably like, think of where they came from to find him. Now they're in this big city. He's 12 years old. They're thinking we're probably going to find his body. Or at best, we find just a, a, a broken, terrified, crying, sobbing 12-year-old boy that just needs his mommy and his daddy. But what do they find? He's totally fine. He's actually where he's supposed to be. And they don't even understand what he's saying. They don't get it. They don't get it. I can hear, I can hear or just imagine as Mary, the words of Simeon are echoing through her head. A sword will pierce through your own soul also. This has got to be painful. So sad. To, and then finds her boy and he's like, what are, you, what are you doing? I'm good. I'm with my father. I'm in his house. Luke has been over and over again pr- pr- pointing us to the devoutness of Mary and Joseph. They're doing things right. They're following the law. They're being obedient. They were devout religious people, but they were missing Jesus in more ways than one. He was missing. They couldn't find him. And then once they find him, it's like they don't even know him. They're missing. They're missing him. What he's saying, they don't get. They're like confused by it. We're going to jump forward about 21 years. There's going to be a, a lot of devout religious people that show up to the temple a lot but they would totally be missing Jesus. And they wouldn't just be missing him, they'd be killing him. And I think we can jump forward 2,000 years and we can look around. Don't look around in here. <laughs> but you can look around and see, man, the, the, the church is probably full of way too many devout religious people that are totally missing Jesus. We're going through the motions. We know the things to say. We know the things to do, but we are missing Jesus. And they say, no, I go to church. Okay, that's not the question. Are you missing Jesus? More than likely, before we look around the room, like, look at ourselves and, and think, man, I'm, maybe I'm not missing Jesus in every area of my life. But where am I missing Jesus? Where am I just going through the motions, just taking the right steps, doing the right thing, but missing the person of Christ, missing the relationship of Christ? It's okay to be there, but you don't have to stay there. You can just hand that over. I would love, I would love to, to talk to you about that. Steve would, if you're in a community group. You, you should have people to talk about, man, where, where are we missing out on Jesus and just going through the motions? That's going to be one of our discussion questions in all of our community groups this week. Where are we, where are we missing out? Hmm. Mary goes to Jesus just completely lost and confused and like, what? Where have you been? Where have you been, Jesus? I imagine we've gone probably to God in the same way. Verse 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. So after this seemingly really awkward interaction, what does Jesus do? He walks out of the temple. He takes the long journey back to Nazareth with his parents and he's submissive to them. He obeys them. It's really actually beautiful. I love how Kent Hughes explains what's happening here at the end of chapter two. He says, despite, he's talking about Mary at first, despite her great Humility and faith, it would take years for Mary to finally put it all together. But the divine 12 year old understood, and his understanding of his divine position produced an unexpected, amazing phenomenon human obedience. I love that. His divine position produced an unexpected and an amazing phenomenon. He left the temple went down on the, the road back to Nazareth, and, and all we really get until he comes back to be baptized as an adult is he was submissive to his parents. His identity, knowing who he was in God and his position, produced obedience, produced just faith and, and, and 
following what he was supposed to do. You guys, the same is true for us. How so? Do we know our divine position? <laughs> We're not divine, but do we know our position because of what Christ has done? What is that producing in us? In us? How, do we, how do we get here? First of all, we need to recognize, again, that this is the only account of the life of Christ that Luke chose to include in his, in his childhood before his um, adult ministry at age 30. And the story ends with telling us that Jesus was obedient to his parents. His response to his newfound identity produced a lifelong obedience. I think we also need to recognize how important the first 30 years of the life of Christ were. He lived a life of only righteousness. Only righteousness. Why does that matter? Because through our justification, God was going to to take his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ's life, and give it to us. It would be imputed or credited to us at the cross. And and, and at the cross, he's going to take all of our sin. And and there's no one in the room that's like disqualified because you've sinned to a certain level. Like all of our sin, he's going to take it and give that to Jesus and just swap it. He's going to say, here, you take... You, you get to give Jesus all of your sin and Jesus is going to give you, in my eyes, he's going to give you all of his righteousness. His righteousness at age 12 in the temple, his righteousness at age 14, 15, 16. His whole life was perfect. And we get that as our new identity. Paul, Paul explains this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lived a perfect and sinless life. And at the cross, because of the cross, God looks at us, if we have put faith in Christ as our Lord and Savior, and sees us clothed in the same righteousness. Christ was stripped naked so we could be clothed in his righteousness. That's huge. That should do something in us. That should be an identity that we now recognize as that's who we are and what should that produce in us? Obedience. Submission. Mission. Love. A lot of these things that have been hijacked to use as ways to get God are just the outflowing of what has been given to us in this new identity. Obedience flows out of knowing who we are in Christ. We, we at Valley Life, we're all about irresistible grace. We're a grace-based church. Our discipleship should be grace-based. It's not about earning. You don't have to earn this. God has given to us freely. We don't boast in what we have done, but what has been given to us. But grace and obedience are not on different teams. They're on the same team. I love what Paul Tripp says. He says, grace doesn't make obedience optional. Obe- obedience is the lifelong calling, calling for followers of Christ. But your obedience is never a fearful payment. Hmm. Does obedience feel like that to you? A fearful payment that you have to make? Obedience, rather, is a hymn of gratitude to the God who met you where you were and did for you what you could not have done for yourself. Your obedience doesn't purchase God's love for you. Christ's blood is the only purchase that could do that. Rather, your obedience is a thankful expression that you understand the significance of God's love being placed on you. It's not about earning anything from God. It's about living out what you have been freely given. And that should change our identity and knowing our identity in Christ, just like Christ knowing his identity as as the Son of God impacted who he was. Like knowing this identity about us should produce something in us. So we're gonna be perfect, we're gonna have to run back to the cross, but but obedience is not a legalistic thing. It's a beautiful response. Turn with me to Philippians chapter two, verse five through eight. We're gonna close here. 
By the way, we just uh, started uh, a study through the book of Philippians uh, in youth group, and we're calling it uh, Gospel Joy in the Struggle, <laughs> and uh, it's such good stuff in here, but, but this is um, totally, I think, hits home what Christ did, and I hope it's motivating. Paul says this, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality of God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found, human, found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus Christ, this 12-year-old boy, grew up being fully submitted and obedient to the Father all the way to the cross. And that would be hard. There would be a time where he would cry <laughs> tears of blood because of how hard obedient, obeying God would be. But this is what he was sent for so that we could be with him forever. Just going back picturing that 12-year-old at the temple looking around, look at all this marveling at the feast at Passover at all these things that were just pointing to who he was and what he would come and do for us so that we could be with God forever. And that's, and that's really um, why we gather. Why we gather, that's why we celebrate, that's why we sing, because of what has been done for us. And um, we're going to have the band come back up and we're going to take communion. And I hope that every time we do this, yes, we do it every week, but I hope that just makes it bigger, not routine. That we're remembering what it costs for us to have this new identity. What it costs Christ, that he was obedient all the way to the cross. And his, his body was broken. His blood was shed and poured out on all of our sins. And, and had it not have been, we would be completely separated from God. But, but since it was, that completely changes us. And I hope that's the motivation for any of your obedience. We can, we can obey for the wrong motives, right? To try to get approval from man, to try to get approval from God. Like, you already have in Christ all the approval you need. So you don't have to fight for it. You can believe it and live it out. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for not just sending your son as an example for us, but sending him as a payment for us. And now he sits on the throne as our king, and we want to, to follow you um, in obedience. We want to, to come to you as um, the, the, the children that you say we are, fully loved, fully clothed in your righteousness, fully forgiven, um, and live out a life of um, joyful obedience for you. In your name, amen. Mm -hmm.